All right, <clears throat> this is Josh T. Franco interviewing Paul Ramirez Jonas at his home in Brooklyn, New York on July 7th, 2020 for the Smithsonian Institution Archives of American Art Pandemic Project. All right, that's the scripted part. Paul, thanks for taking 20 minutes out to talk um, to us and put this year on the record. So we really just, you got the question club, but we just want to know how American artists have been doing since March. Um, so we can just start with how are you? I'm okay, I guess. Um, I mean, I'm lucky I have a job and I continue to have a job and will probably continue to have a job in the future. And, uh, and I haven't gotten sick and uh, no one in my immediate family has gotten sick either. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think that I have absolutely no complaints uh, from what, what are they called? The primary needs? <laughs> it's like that whole scale of needs. <laughs> so I'm well, I'm well physically <laughs> and economically. Um, but I'm, otherwise, I have a, a lot of different emotions about what's going on. Yeah. And you've had some big life events happen just coincidentally during this. But I don't want to get to those. But I do want to talk about your job because you're a teacher, besides being an artist mm -hmm. at Hunter College, which is in New York, and New York's hardest hit. So I don't know what you can say about conversations about, you know, what the fall might look like, what happened in the spring when it was disrupted for students. Well, it's such an um, amazing moment, right? Because we've had this cascade of events happening. And, um, and I keep coming to this thing where it's like a hall of mirrors where like uh, COVID-19 has created like a health crisis and then and then the health crisis created an economic crisis. And then, the, and then now there's a, a kind of societal political crisis. And, uh, but they all mirror each other. And I keep thinking that what's interesting is also in people's personal lives, things are being mirrored. And I, what I keep thinking is like everything that you could shove under the rug before or look away or you would tolerate has suddenly become intolerable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, things that were invisible because we didn't want to see like how much we depended on really cheap immigrant labor or undocumented labor now is glaring you know mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the school the same things have happened in the school so it began as like the opportunity of teaching remotely and how amazing actually that turned out to be mm. uh, but then the financial repercussions, will we reopen? If we reopen, can students afford it? Because I teach at a public university and most of my students, uh, a, a, a significant amount of them pay for it as they go through working. Uh, almost all of them go part-time, at least half of their degree. We encourage them. So that is started to hit. And now, of course, it's uh, 1968 all over again, you know, where the students are demanding that the faculty undergo anti-racist training that we decolonize the program. So when you're asking what the fall is going to look like, you know, it, it, it's gone from, can we open because of the virus? Then like, how can we open with the financial uh, free fall of the university? And now on top of it is like, and the students rightly so want to burn the place down to the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> As you, that, I mean, that kind of, that idea of, um, you know, stuff that's been under the rug is coming out and like how we are, what, who we are as civic people and agents, it seems like very relevant to a lot of things your as an artist, your studio projects speak to usually more playfully. Um, but I don't know, like as in, yeah, just not even like what's new resulting from it, but has this moment, does it make you reflect differently on your existing projects based on like civic contracts and promises? And... Well, it's interesting because I feel like uh, whenever I reimagine monuments, right? There's always right. This idea oh, yeah. that, the, that the monuments should uh, include uh, our, our voices, that they shouldn't be these things where the status quo inscribes public space in permanent materials. So, so I have this spiel that I say, you know, like uh, stone and, concrete and uh, bronze are permanent inscriptions in public space, but our voices are ephemeral and the materials should reflect our voices. And, the, and I feel like, okay, I can put that body of work to rest because now uh, if my work was a suggestion, 
now the work what the work was about is being enacted all the time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, conf like Confederate monuments become just plinths with uh, inscriptions from the public written directly on them, right? It's like, oh, that could have been one of my sculptures totally, at one yeah. point, you know, and, uh, or throwing Columbus into the river. I'm like, ah, I should have done that as a sculpture. <laughs> <you know? laughs> um, yeah, it's true. So, but then the part about the public that's about tr of my work that's interactive about trusting or how we use language to negotiate contracts that continues to be um, really important. I think. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm hoping to make a project in Philadelphia next year, and uh, now speaking with a resident of the neighborhood where it, where it might be, and it was super interesting because she was talking how about the homeless population. And she said, well, they're my neighbors because uh, they live next door to me. And so she was talking about how she relates to them as neighbors. And I, I'm, not, I'm digressing, but I'm thinking a lot about that. It's like, what, how amazing that this person can define, redefine the homeless as neighbors yeah. because they live next door to her. And what makes a person uh, see a human being like that versus seeing a human being as almost not a human being? but a, a problem that needs to be removed. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the civil is two different kinds of, of civic contracts there, right? Uh, are you your brother's keeper or are you not your brother's keeper? Mm -hmm. and, and this is happening now in spades all over the country, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Down to the mask, right? Do, do you wear the mask? Do you not wear the mask? Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, have you been, you know, you're in New York. How, what, did you observe the marches? Yeah, it's impossible not to observe the marches. Yeah. Um, the same way that it was impossible. I think that's what's different perhaps about New York than the rest of the country. Uh, 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 one of the changes in my life that you alluded to is that we, we had a baby in the middle of this pandemic, which was a nerve wracking experience. Um, uh, everything from going to the doctor and then not going to the doctor anymore and doing the the doctor uh, things remotely to going to the hospital in the middle of the pandemic and delivering all of that was supercharged uh, but uh but what I was going to say is that the thing about being in New York is that uh, you cannot avoid seeing any of these things that you and I have been talking about mm -hmm. when it was just the pandemic at the beginning. Uh, the city became very quiet because of the total lockdown. But what you could hear were the ambulance sirens nonstop, right? Because there were, there were being so many cases per day. Mm -hmm. um, or because we're such a dense city, I could just go for a walk and three blocks from here is a hospital and you could see the refrigerated truck parked outside for the excess uh, bodies, right? Uh, but then when the protests began, um, because we had a newborn, we, we couldn't participate. And, uh, but you know, three times, and I don't live on a major street, three times one of the manifestations was just making its way through Brooklyn, it just went right in front of our window. Um, or we would go for a walk in Prospect Park with the baby and then we would bump into a manifestation. So uh, both the virus of racism and the virus of, of uh, COVID could not be not seen, right, in a city mm -hmm. like New York. Um, and it continues, you know, it continues. Uh, yeah. Or, or sometimes you just look up at the sky, you see a police helicopter and you'll be like, there's a demonstration over there. <laughs> <laughs> just follow the chopper. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, this is just interesting because I think our tone is, we don't, because um, I've gotten to know you over the last couple of years and, um, it just hit me how serious the tone of this conversation is, which is not, that's just what the world is, I guess. Anyway, so just observation. No, but it's interesting because yeah. I, I am a, try to be a funny person and I use humor a lot uh, socially and in my work, but, um, and there's always, you know, the bane of the white Latino, like, you know, am I a person of color? No, but am I a minority? Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, and then, uh, and actually my daughter and I have had a lot of conversations about race because, um, in her school, she she is considered a person of color, mm. and and I always misunderstood that she would get really angry at me and be like, "Ah, but you're white," you know. And but then she'd be like, "But I don't have a choice." Yeah. 
that I don't get to decide that, you know, the, the white majority decides that I'm a Latina and that's the end of the story. I don't have any more say as to what I am. Mm -hmm. um, so a roundabout way of saying that I always feel like, yeah, you know, I don't really have the right because, you know, the color of my skin, I've never really had to undergo any feelings of oppression or exclusion that I know of, but, but I am angry. You know, and I'm usually never angry. And I'm yeah. angry about, about school and I'm angry about how uh, this, my colleagues are handling this moment. Or actually, how my colleagues are not handling this moment, how they're denying it or trying to pacify it. And then I see what I've done as a professor in that institution for a couple of years. And I get angrier because I'm like, come on, it's not rocket science. You know, have an inclusive mm -hmm. curriculum. Uh, every time you have a chance to hire someone, hire someone that looks like the student body. You know, it, it's, it's sort of like a no-brainer, right? Like doing the minimum is a no-brainer. And, uh, and seeing the inability, reluctance, denial to do the minimum amount to create a more equitable society or to take this kind of liberal stance of like, oh, my hands are tied. The system is too strong. You know? Yeah. I'm like, that's a cop out, mm -hmm. which before I would have never um, had the fire in me to see it that way. Mm. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I, I didn't want to just the Latino thing and your daughter and you and the differences. I mean, I just, we, you know, we've, this is nice that it's us talking because I would like to hear more about what you think about, you know, it's, I think the conversation on the big scale right now has been so binary black and white and I think that's appropriate right now. Right. Black Lives Matter is the focus and good but it is like figuring out my role and I've had to think of my role as who I just am as a person but also my role as national collector at the archives and I had to really realize those are distinct to not resent the work I was being asked to do in separate positions. <laughs> um, but anyway, we, you know, <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, no, it's interesting for, for, yeah. for, because before you and I could have a very intellectual conversation, what is Latin American? Mm -hmm. What is Latino? Oh, well, what about, you know, when the United States annexed huge chunks of Mexico? Mm -hmm. you know, what about Puerto Rico? That's more like a colonial imperial situation. Yeah. Uh, but the bottom line is, black bodies look black and they have received the brunt of racism in this country and and they came under the legacy of of slavery mm -hmm. so i think uh and that's interesting because at least at school i see great clarity among the latin students the latinx students mm -hmm. like they see that this is the moment to support mostly their efforts against getting rid of anti-blackness yeah it, but it's a funny thing, right? Because it's not like, depending on the color of their skin, that they do not themselves. Yeah, uh, it's you, complicated, you know, yeah. I think, you know, it's interesting you say you, you don't really recall moments you felt it. I do, because I, I think I have a more mestizo face than you yeah. do. And um, this is so funny that this is on Zoom too. We've never done oral <laughs> histories virtually so people can see our face. <laughs> this, this, yeah. is, this is the brown spectrum here. Oh, uh, that's funny. So, okay, I don't want to talk too much about myself. We have seven minutes. These are so- Oh my God. I know. Okay, I'm going to focus on some questions about this moment. Uh, this has been interesting. What do you think's been missing from accounts of the two pandemics happening now, COVID and racism? Um, well, it seems the usual, right? The thing that always seems a little bit missing in the United States, at least, is like a seeing how everything, at least in my eyes, because I tend to see things very much as uh, in a kind of Marxist class thing, right? That the big unmentionable is extractive capitalism, right? And it's like, why are our social services so gutted? You know, why is our, uh, our healthcare, well, like we don't really have it, you know? Uh, like we can't mount a response because we don't have national healthcare. Uh, so it's all piecemeal, you know, how, uh, so like Cuomo, the governor of New York, can, can be fantastic and say how he's going to take all these disparate hospitals and explain that 
disparate now they have to work together but he won't talk about why are they disparate you know why are hospitals even corporations for profit you know um so that's i think what's and and you can tie that right back to race right mm -hmm. um i i think that uh or, or back to that the essential workers are paid so little you know um I think that's the glue on everything, and I feel like no, no one wants to touch that too much. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's deep under the rug still. Yeah, Maybe still we'll under out. the rug. I know, <laughs> we can get it out. Another thing we want to know about is um, how people's access to their studios have changed. If they have studios apart from home, can they get to them? I know you work at school a lot. Yeah, no, uh, my studio is in a municipal building, so technically, well, technically, it was never shut down. However, the, we were also asked not to leave home for necessary reasons. So I decided really early on that uh, making art was not an essential mm. a thing. So through phase one, I didn't go to my studio. And uh, now we're on phase three starting two days ago. And I went to the studio yesterday. Uh, but also tied to like the pregnancy and the baby. And we were crazy careful not to get sick because it was very unclear what COVID would or could do to to the gestation of the baby. So um, I, I just, I went to the studio once before the lockdown, got some papers, got some pens. And, and I don't know if that right now is the moment to make art, to tell you the truth. Uh, it, yeah. Um, what did it feel like to go back? Oh, it was funny because everything was, ex <laughs> it's like those movies, you know, where there's like, and there's still like crumbs on the desk from where someone was having breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the preciously preserved artist studio. The most. Yeah, yeah. It, it was like, you're right. Like <laughs> because it's not like I left one day and thinking, uh, I got to leave it tidy because I'm never coming back for months and months. It's just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. So what about your home there? Have you, has your relationship to your home changed? I bet you value your roof access much more. Oh my God, yes, we value <laughs> the roof access. And, uh, and I went a little bit crazy, right? So like I, I said, a little irrigation system. Again, back to like pandemic and baby, it was like, once the baby's born, we're not gonna have time to water, you know? So like, uh, but also like many Americans, we all went a little bit homesteading crazy. We're like, Mm -hmm. Let's start seeds from home in the windowsill, you know, and let's grow more edible plants. I've and, been uh, dyeing my own clothes. <laughs> you've been dyeing your own clothes. Uh, my daughter Indra has been making clothes and adapting mm -hmm. things. And uh, we've been learning new ways of cooking because you get so tired of your own cooking, right? So you're like, well, let's try to make something Thai, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, we've been spending a lot of time at home. And my partner, Deborah Fisher, is the founder of a very fierce organization called Blade of Grass. And they are working online. So, um, and now they've decided to permanently work uh, remotely. So they closed their office. So we had to make space for a home office for her. And, um, but it's great. It's like the kitchen, the dining room table sometimes has this thing of like a sewing project of my daughter's and then like some drawings that I'm working on. And mm -hmm. you know, some, so, there's also remnants of a meal and something Deborah's working on. So this relatively small dining room table has become a like this weird <laughs> forum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Interdisciplinary. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, we have a couple minutes left, Paul. What would you so you know the archives we're doing these and lots of institutions are creating content right now. Yeah. The difference for us is that we're always, our audience, we think of so much as the kind of hundred years in the future audience. So from that perspective, what would you, what's the important thing to let people know about being an artist at this time? Hmm. Well, maybe the most interesting thing is something my friend Patrick told me at the very beginning of this, when uh, the museums were shutting down and the galleries were shutting down. And he's like, is it an amazing, the whole art world can shut down but we're still artists. <laughs> and it was such a simple thing, but it's like, right, your identity as artists is actually uh, separate from these institutions that present art. And, and I think that's always the hopeful, I always say that the great thing about being an artist is uh, you can make art and you're an artist, but if you're an actor and the theaters are closed, uh, mm. <laughs> oh. 
You froze. You froze too. Oh. Are we back? Yes. That's, I mean, also this technology is the new thing in all of our lives, right? And the freezes. Yes. Um, uh, but let's, let's just consider that the, the closing line, that you don't have to have the institution to be an artist. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Oh, 20 minutes. <laughs>